Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar about the Department of Education's uh, third-party servicer guidance. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about the uh, uh, OPM questions that came out uh, around that as well. Very happy to see you all all here today, and thanks for for joining us. Uh, just a, a few housekeeping uh, things. Uh, uh, one is that we do invite you to use chat to uh, talk among yourselves and to ask questions of each other. We won't uh, have the Q&A part open because one of the things we did was that we asked for uh, questions ahead of time and we must have a lot of questions because we have a lot of people signed up for this and we received a lot of questions. We received well over 100 questions for this. We won't get through all 100 questions. Some of them we were able to uh, categorize together and uh, we'll get to those at the end and, and, and talk about those that were uh, pre-submitted. Very good, very good questions on that. Uh, some of you sought yes and no answers. Uh, we might not always have uh, a yes or no, but we'll give you our best interpretations on, on what's going on. And we do want to remind you that, uh, yes, this is being recorded. And yes, uh, we will sh uh, share the slides. Uh, people always ask that, even though I've yet to been on hardly any uh, webinars where anyone's ever done, not shared those things, but we will share all of that for you. Uh, with that, let's go to the next slide and I want to introduce our panel again. I'm Russ Poulin, uh, Executive, Executive Director of WCT, the Wichi Cooperative for Educational Technologies. Um, uh, we're, while we're part of Wichi, uh, which is a regional organization, uh, we focus on uh, uh, digital learning uh, issues and especially the policy issues. We have members in all 50 states and DC and a few, a few in Canada and a few from a few other places. Uh, with that, Cheryl, let me turn it to you to introduce yourself. Thank you, Russ. I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the Senior Director for the State Authorization Network, SAN, and WCET Policy Innovations. So my primary focus is on the State Authorization Network, which is also a membership organization. We're a division of WCET, but our focus is on the um, regulatory compliance and management for consumer protections for out-of-state activity compliance. And I'll turn it to Phil. Hi, my name is Phil Hill, uh, consultant and market analyst uh, with Phil Hill and Associates. We're actually in the middle of rebranding the company. But in any case, most people know me from the blog. Uh, so on EdTech is the blog by Phil Hill and Associates and who the associates are, we'll get to uh, outside of this webinar. But we basically cover all things EdTech and not necessarily the technology itself, but all of the impact. And today, as we're talking about, policy is a huge area of impact. So we do consulting and market analysis in this area. And I love working with WCET and SAM. So I'm looking forward to today. Yes, yeah, Phil, uh, you're seeing you know three people here who geek out on such things. Uh, so we enjoy, enjoy talking to each other and we hope that uh, we can bring it up so that you don't have to be a geek to listen to all this, but geeks are welcome. Uh, let's move to the next slide uh, where we have a very fuzzy picture of uh, Peter Bergman, the actor, and uh, they had this caveat where I, I wondered, I often said this, uh, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on, on TV, uh, that that's a phrase that I thought, well, it can't be that old. Well, it goes back to uh, Vicks uh, Medicine ads from 1984, and this uh, picture, very fuzzy picture, is from an ad from 1986, uh, where he played, in, you know, Peter Bergman played a, a doctor on uh, All My Children, but the point of this is, is that uh, we really have to be clear um, that we're not providing legal advice. Uh, uh, we're providing our opinions based upon um, our best reading of what's coming out of the department and also talking to a lot of people who uh, either have talked to the people in the department or who have um, or, or other legal advice and, and uh, are giving us legal, their legal thoughts, if not advice on it. Uh, and so uh, we are not providing official regulatory interpretations, so don't don't take it that way. So with the caveats out of the way, let's go ahead and move on to the next part and some background about where did all, all this uh, come from. And then on uh, February 15th that uh, uh, you'll see here, and then we have some uh, links there to this uh, press release that they came out where there actually was two parts to this press release uh, that, that came out and one was about online program managers and that they're gonna ask questions about about them, but also that some new guidance that went into effect immediately that's since been changed about third party servicers. Let's move to the next slide on this. And remember that was guidance and, wanted to, and we're gonna uh, uh, talk about what guidance is and, and all this, but thought 
I give you a, a quick uh, refresher and uh, this is really condensed down and so uh, doesn't have all the legal language in it here, but just to remind you that a law is something that's passed by Congress. And so that, you know, that is a law that is some rules on some activity plus any penalties involved. Uh, a regulation, uh, something else that, there, that if it's uh, financial aid related that the uh, Department of Ed has a rulemaking process that includes uh, notifications, getting a rulemaking team and putting it out for public comment. For this, uh, that and, uh, this is uh, guidance, so it's something where the department can just put it out when they when they when they wish. Don't have to go through the formal process, but it's typically used more for uh, clarifications and some things. People have asked about well, how do we enforce this, or how how are we to comply, or like in the case of uh, COVID, that there were temporary exceptions that uh, uh, that happened over things that couldn't wait for a regulatory process. Uh, let's move on to the to, to the next slide. Get that, and then we talked about OPMs and third-party services. Uh, most of you know about these things, but the the, um, the OPMs you know, they help with with all sorts of services in uh, online education, helping to get them go and get getting them out there and and offering them. And then third-party services is one that we probably uh, haven't heard as much uh, in the past. It was mostly focused on uh, tools that were used around uh, financial aid uh, processing. All this, but now this uh, part down at the bottom of that uh, to address any aspect of an institution's participation, it's been uh, expanded out a bit. Uh, let's move to the next next slide, and I'll say a few things about the uh, the OPM part and the questions that they asked about that before uh, most of the rest of this uh, uh, webcast will be about the third party services. But thought we would uh, say something since the OPM was in there. And it got really confusing about, was this about OPMs or third-party services or both of them together? And what was guidance and what was not that, that people got really confused. And in fact, it took us a few days to parse that all out in order to actually write a blog post that was coherent about it. So um, just about OPMs that there's a lot of concern about uh, some of the uh, uh, practices and fiscal models used that if you have the revenue share or incentive compensation, and really what they worry about is that there is a, um, a amount of money uh, uh, that the OPM gets you know, per enrollment on that. And there's a thought of that, there was people have called that sort of a bounty per student and maybe bringing in the worst part of uh, for-profit practices into uh, public and nonprofit institutions. And then the other is the fee for service uh, where the OPMs, you know, they decide that they want uh, instructional design or they want recruiting or whatever that they play a fat ra flat rate for that but again that is often set on you know how much do you want to recruit or how much instructional design do you want and so and then down at the bottom there that there was some guidance uh, that came out in 2011 that allowed for some incentive compensations as long as the if you had a revenue share contract that was part of a bundle that you paid for all at once and there's been some real fears that that has been uh a big loophole that has allowed for some unsavory practices to happen. And let's move to the to the next slide. And wanted to get to uh, some things here where just letting you know about uh, some of the concerns that have been raised just in the last few years, uh, officially that the uh, Senators Brown and Warren uh, had previously uh, worried about this and then sent a letter last year to the owners of several of these companies uh, asking for data uh, about uh, their practices. Uh, let's go to the next one, Catherine. And uh, that uh, then last year, there was a government accounting office uh, report that came out that said education department needs to do better in terms of monitoring these arrangements and perhaps uh, making sure that students are protected. And then finally, the, uh, the third one here that just this year, just a few weeks ago, uh, Representative Rosa DeLauro of uh, Connecticut Note that she's the ranking member of the House Appropriations Committee. You know, was calling these uh, OPMs uh, predators, and you know, or some of them were uh, predators in terms of what they're doing. So, lots of uh, pressure on the uh, Department of Education in terms of what they uh, uh, they need to do more and need to uh, work on these uh, from these different sources, as well as a lot of the consumer protection groups have, have written. You go to our first uh, blog post that we had out there that there is a. Uh, go to our first blog post that we have you know, several links to those uh, articles as well. With that, let's move to the next uh, slide. 
uh, just very quickly that they had nine questions about OPMs that they wanted uh, the public to comment on, and especially about the, the uh, revenue sharing or incentive compensation. I, I'm, I'm paraphrase six of them here, but this gives you an idea that they wanted to see what the institution's experiences were and also what are better ways that they could uh, regulate these things uh, on that. And so with that, I'm going to uh, uh, move on and go to the next slide. And I believe the next one is uh, going to, uh, oh no, we have OPO, just that we did have the commenting, uh, WCT and SAN uh, did, uh, uh, we, we canvassed our members who had OPMs uh, that we got feedback from them and that we submitted a comment based upon uh, their experiences, which was uh, both uh, both very positive to very negative to most of them were in the middle, that they had some things that could be better. And so we wanted to reflect uh, reflect their, their experience with that. Okay, now I'll move on to Cheryl and the next slide. Thank you very much, Russ. So as Russ was saying, you know, we received this um, press release from the department that uh, had a conglomeration of things. Um, we had to piece it apart. It took us a little bit of time. Um, however, we were able to distinguish, as Russ indicated, the first part of the uh, press release addressed the OPMs and their interest in learning more. So it was a request for information. But then we got to the point where they were saying, no, we're also going to provide additional guidance about third-party servicers. So we go to the guidance and the guidance address that the third-party servicer is defined in federal, it's defined in statutorily also, um, but in federal regulation as an entity that enters into a contract with an institution to administer any aspect of the institutions participate in any Title IV HEA program and then lists a non-exhaustive list of functions. And so what I want to point out here before we move forward is that the department was very specific about the use of the term any aspect found in regulation. We go to the next slide, please. So keeping in mind the whole idea of any aspect, what we see is the department's view that in its newest revised guidance that we have here, that they maintain that most activities by outside entities are subject to the department's oversight because the activities, and again, use this term, intrinsically intertwine with the administration of Title IV. And so I wanna point out again that this is revised guidance. And so Niels to say, since this was first released, uh, we've had our ear to the ground to listen to as many or read as many um, reviews, analysis of the guidance as we can. And I, I was interested to find that there was particular um, analysis provided by a law firm that showed a graphic of this nice little circle from the first guidance, and then a slightly bigger circle for the second guidance, and then a very large circle for the, for the third guidance, showing that it had expanded in terms of what functions might be found to be a third-party servicer, to the point that there is some confusion about what could be, because we're looking into new areas, and I'll talk about surprises there, but what I want to share first is this uh, you are this uh, email address here because the department in their guidance did indicate that if there are any questions about what is a TPS, what is what would be um, subject to the new TP, to TPS requirements and is a new function um, for your purposes, to please contact them for clarification. So case teams at ed.gov. And we'll talk about that again in a few minutes, but you have this as an opportunity to reach out to the department to determine if your functions are a TPS. Next slide, please. So within this guidance I was sharing before, they talked about the intrinsically intertwined and then provided a table. And this table is not new, it's a charting of the various um, areas that could be services that are outsourced by the institution. Um, and in that there are these, this laundry list of, um, of services. And within each of those was the table with two different sides. And on one side, they were trying to explain what functions within these categories were considered an aspect of an institution's participation in Title IV programs, and then contrast that with what would not be. 
And what was interesting is over time being able to look to previous guidance and see that the development of the um, what is considered, what are the descriptions within these uh, categories has grown. And so we're, we're interested to find out the parameters as we see this growth. We go to the next slide, please. So there are a few surprises for, for us as we looked through it. So first, we had received uh, early in um, 2023, the intention of the, the, the notice that there might be, it wasn't even the notice, it was thought that from the, from the calendar of events that uh, there could be another rulemaking and we could see um, a, um, an official notice for another rulemaking that is to include third party servicers. So we were quite a bit surprised to see this guidance as opposed to what's coming forward for rulemaking. So this is before what we anticipate to be a notice for further rulemaking that will address third party services that we will probably see in fall of winter um, of, this, of this coming year. So we'll look for that to see what the rulemaking will entail. But as far as increased scope of the guidance, we saw some areas, educational content and instruction, provision of software products and services involving Title IV administrative activities and recruiting and, intention, and retention. So something that the department has um, addressed is um, that they had previously shared that non-US owned or controlled companies were ineligible to be a TPS. And we found that in the 2016 guidance, which was updated in 2017, as part of a Q&A that was an attachment to the guidance. So this wasn't, although new, was also found in, like I said, a Word document in 2016, revised 2017. So it's not new, but it had not been fully, fully discussed um, to know what those parameters would be. And then finally, in this last bullet, we were surprised as we were determining that state agencies could be considered a third party servicer when we consider that states sometimes act as a consortium um, to supply different aspects of programs for distance education within the institutions within their state. We go to the next slide, please. So, so what? So what does this mean? So, um, when this was initially released as guidance in mid-February, um, it was indicated that the guidance, and we'll talk about it in a second, was to be considered effective as of the date of release. But, and that institutions though, would have a period of time to identify all of their third-party services they would have until May 1st. The department revised their guidance about two weeks later um, after the prompting from several organizations indicating that this would take some time for institutions to review the activities with their servicers. So they have expanded that date until September 1st so that institutions can identify their third party servicers. And the reason this is important is because third, third party servicers would be conducting yearly federal audits. Um, they could be liable for misapplication of Title IV aid. And what I understand is a real speed bump for some servicers was that they would be held joint and severally liable with the institution for any violation of Title IV requirements that are resulting from functions per performed by the servicer. So that is something that is expanded for some servicers, some contracts, some um, vendors who are working with institutions. We go to the next slide, please. And so, as I was mentioning before, what we see here is the hyperlink to the requirements and responsibilities for third party servicers and institutions. This is an updated guidance. And as I said a minute ago, it was to be effective immediately, but they have, they have um, extended the effective date to September 1st. So with the effective date also comes the reporting responsibilities. So institutions would update uh, they're reporting on um, third party uh, servicers, contractors, vendors um, that are now considered a TPS would be uh, required to, to submit a third party servicer data form. And the link to that is also provided within the guidance. And um, the last but not least is the opportunity for, the, um, for any interested party to submit written public comments. And the deadline for that is now 
March 30 of, of this month. So uh, you have until March 30th, um, you see some cross outs there. The original deadline was uh, 317 in the original guidance. Then they expanded it to 329. Then they recounted how many days actually was the um, 30 days out, which put them to uh, March 30. So um, there has been some confusion about that, but we do know for certain now that the deadline is March 30th of 2023, and the hyperlink is available there um, to reach the place to submit your public comment. Next slide, please. And so my, my last thought here is to share that you have the opportunity to provide public comment uh, but here is another opportunity to uh, communicate with the department. In the guidance, the department specifically offers the opportunity if the institution is unsure whether the institution or entity is subject to TPS requirements, that you, you may contact the school participation division at that email address there, caseteams at ed.gov. And we are aware that at this point, the department is collecting these questions and also waiting until the end of the public comment period to review all of this and provide further um, guidance or FAQs they indicated. Um, we also are aware that they had offered in one situation, maybe others, uh, the ability to review the contract to make a determination of whether it actually falls in that third party servicer type of contract. So. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Phil. Hi, thank you, Cheryl. And I'd really like to pick up on uh, one of the points that Cheryl was making. We're talking about the definition of TPS, how it's grown from one area, then it's expanded, and then it's expanded. And we're talking about the conflating of two different uh, guidance uh, going together, bundled services exception plus the TPS definition. So there's a risk of sort of missing the scope of what's happening here. So for example, in the definition of what is the TPS, there was, it used to be five bullet points that described it. And it all dealt with Title IV programs interpreted as dealing with financial aid and reporting on financial aid. Things such as for the institution to remain eligible to participate in Title IV, that's financial aid, et cetera. Well, there's a new bullet in here that really changes everything. And that bullet point says, in the new guide says to provide Title IV eligible educational programs. And so really what you have here is you're, you're saying, now we're defining program as an academic or educational program at an institution that's eligible for financial aid. And that is a huge difference. That is what has led to this um, expansion into instructional content into most of ed tech. And at the same time, we already talked about the fact that buried in a Q&A from 2016 was this provision about non-US owned, non-US located uh, companies being excluded from being a TPS. So take those two things and combine them together. Now, all of a sudden, it impacts study abroad. We're going to address some of these questions, but there's a whole host of non-U.S. companies that at least on the surface of the new guidance are ineligible to provide these services to U.S. schools. The point I'm trying to make is the fact that this action is unprecedented in scope and in lack of process. And we need to take a look back at the big picture about why this is happening to understand what's like, what the implications are going to be, and you know what should we expect to see. It, it takes a deeper dive. A uh, quick comment uh, that came up during the ASU GSV conference a year and a half ago, and Paul LeBlanc was giving a session. It was almost an offhand comment, but it has hit right at home. His point was that back during the Obama administration, the Department of Education seemed to have a dual role. You had a lot of the initiatives about innovation, you know, how to enable competency-based education programs, how to enable different types of alternative models. Balancing that with a consumer protection mentality, how do we look out for bad companies and protect students? How do we do this? And what's happened is during the Biden administration, even though you have a lot of the same people, 
all of the effort has moved to the consumer protection. So you need to think from a political standpoint and from a consumer protection mindset to understand how this happened and what's likely to happen in the future. And because you're really looking at the intention of saying, how do we protect students from predatory companies in particular, particularly OPM? That is really driving the initiatives that the various people are going after. So that gets to the question of why are these issues conflated, the bundled services exception and TPS, and why use guidance? Well, part of the issue is I had written a post a, a year ago talking about that there's increased regulatory act activism within the Department of Education with the intent of using regulations or guidance to achieve their goals, consumer protection being the biggest one that we're looking at. And if you follow these things, it led to these two guidance issues being added together, but they make sense from if you think in the same terms that we talked about before, consumer protection, we think OPMs are, there's a lot of predatory behavior. How do we protect people? And I think that's led to the situation that we have with this dramatic increase in scope and at the same time, a lack of any real process to get input on what the implications are. There is a survey that WCET put out on getting, trying to get feedback on what they're hearing. And there's, I really want to point out these two bullet points because I'm hearing the exact same thing on my side, the people I'm talking to. On one hand, we're getting the entire, well, the majority of the higher ed community in agreement on the big impact of this guidance. Even the organizations that tend to be neutral um, are saying, oh my gosh, this is going to be a massive change and it hasn't been thought through and we don't have input. And so there's this general agreement. But at the same time, what we keep hearing is there's a lot of surprise at the Department of Education of, oh, I didn't know this was going to be such a problem. I didn't know people would push back or even I didn't know people would interpret rules these ways. And so we have this dual situation of agreement on one hand of huge changes, but surprise that it's actually happening. Next slide, please. And so that's partially leading to the reaction, I think, that we're seeing. So for example, in a, and uh, in in, in some of these give direct links to the blog posts where they're covered. But if you look at the Department of Education, it appears that they're seeking a way out of the situation. They do recognize the, the massive feedback that they're getting through comments and in other routes. But we have not yet seen a willingness to confront the fundamental underlying problems beneath it. So, for example, there was an anonymous interview with Times Higher Education where a spokesman or somebody from the Department of Education was saying providing computer services or software where the provider has no access to or control over other systems would not fall into the category of a third party provider. But then if you look at what was actually written, there was a phrase that's added saying this exclusion is limited only to where the computer products or services are essentially self-hosted and 100% under institutional control. Well, in this day and age of cloud computing, that basically makes that exclusion moot for most cases. The point I'm trying to make here is the fact that we definitely seem to be in a situation where there's likely to be a change coming out of the comment period, but I'm not at all convinced that we know what those changes are gonna be. So we're in this fluid situation that has enormous scope and impact. Next slide, please. Okay, so what should we expect? Again, all indications are that uh, the Department of Education is hearing the feedback and will revise the guidance at a minimum. So on one hand, you can say, oh, this is, this is going to be good. We won't have as big of a problem moving forward. And I'll remind you what Russ said. I'm not a doctor. I'm just playing one on a webinar. Um, we don't know when um, the changes will happen, but the best guess is April or May after comments are done. 
It's possible if you look at the comments, the Department of Education will only make tiny changes at the margins, leaving the fundamental impacts in place. But even so, the market impacts, um, at least for the next year, will come from how institutions interpret the guidance and the confusion, not necessarily what people intend or hope that it reads. Because if you're a school, you need to be careful of, well, I don't want to get in trouble, so I'm going to be conservative in my interpretations. So it's a dynamic situation that we're looking at, and politics is hugely important in it. So with that in mind, we'd like to, uh, we got some uh, excellent questions, over 100 questions submitted as part of the registration for this webinar. So we'd like to address as many of them as we can. Uh, so I'll turn it back over uh, so we can do different Q&A, if you will, from the registered questions. Yes, yeah, and we thank everyone for, for sending in the, those questions. We are looking a bit at the, the chat as well, but we'll try to get through uh, through quite a few of these. and. One of the questions that uh, was assigned to me was about, well, who is affected by the, the guidance? You know, what what uh, departments, academics, technology service admissions will be uh, affected by this? And uh, pretty much it could be everyone. Uh, and then uh, one of our friends, I see, a, hello, shout out to Erica, who came up with the, uh, if it breathes on Title IV, it is in, included, uh, or it could be included in, in all of this. And so that you, and just, uh, uh, you know, for a, an organization that doesn't uh, uh, that is pretty moderate on most issues is the uh, uh, NASFA, the, the financial aid folks. That you know, one of the things they said is that, well, what happens? You could have a nonprofit uh, behavioral mental health organization helping out, and and uh, is that if they're helping out with students, is that then helping with retention, and therefore affecting financial aid, and then being in this? And there's a lot of these things where we're um, we're trying to figure it out, and that will be. And as uh, Phil was saying, we're uh, looking for more more guidance on this. Um, but another question had to do. There's lot, several questions around. Well, why are they doing this, and why now? Uh, so, what is the uh, what is behind this, and don't they have a negotiated rulemaking coming up on this? Uh, uh, so, this is a good question. Uh, we do think it's uh, related to the OPM thing because those were uh, bundled together. Uh, in the, in in this, and so we think that that uh, uh, that thinking that you know affected what came out out of this. You know, uh, we're a little unsure about you know why. It, it, as Phil was saying, said that it, in, in that we put in our blog post, we don't think they were thinking that this was as expansive um, a move as possible. And I want to turn to Phil and get some more thoughts on that in a second. But I do want to say that yeah, somebody said, isn't there a uh, uh, negotiated rulemaking coming later this year. Yes, uh, third-party services was one of the things that was in uh, supposed to be in negotiated rulemaking later this year. Phil, what would you like to say more about uh, why they're doing this? Well, and again, I think the OPM angle is the key here. And if you look at what OPMs provide, um, it can be all the way from marketing and recruiting, defining the uh, programs that you're under, it, uh, technology provision, LMS provision, instructional content development, retention. And if you think about, I have data basing those. If you look at a lot of the TPS um, additions that have been added, they fit within those categories. And I believe that that is why, uh, that was the driver of why this came in there. It wasn't separate from the OPMs. It was almost like deconstructing what an OPM is. And I think that's part of the reason we ended up this way. Okay, um, and then who decides? You know, what is a, a TPS? It's an, another uh, question, and you know, and finally, it's the department. And then I'm seeing coming up in the uh, uh, in the chat the same questions that we've been getting all along: is that uh, does this service fill in the blank service uh, fit into this? <laughs> and um, and it's really hard to go down through one one after another because there's so many dependencies upon uh, does it you could at one place you could do it one way and in another institution you could do it another way and it's the impact on financial aid and so uh, I also saw that his place said if the, uh, the he enjoyed that it said if the institution is unsure he says well this guidance is custom made to generate uncertainty so there's the uh, there is uh, you're going to have to do some interpretation and 
uh, move for, uh, and just keep watching this and do as best you can as you move as you move forward. Um, other comments on that? Uh, if not, I'll move forward then on uh, yeah. uh, enforcement and consequences. Uh, uh, you know what what happens with all this? Uh, you know, can they really in, uh, force it? And that uh, just a reminder that institutions will. Uh, they'll be asked by September 1st to report uh, all TPS vendors uh, uh, and TPS and third party service vendors uh, um, must also fill out a form unclear what happens if they decide because some of them have decided that they're not one. And so what happens if you decide they are and they decide they're not or vice versa sorts of things, but you you need to uh, to work on that and then the, uh, the vendor those uh, those who are a third party service must conduct a a federal audit annually, and the uh, institution uh, could be checked on this during a, a financial aid audit to see, um, oh, you have this service. Did you, are you overseeing it as a third party service, and do you have the proper paperwork in? And that's something that could happen, and that the uh, consequences could be either a fine or if you have something where through that service that, that you're, uh, something is happening to students that you could be. Uh, um, liable for federal federal financial aid uh, penalties on that as well. Nothing else. I'll move on to the to the next one. I'll have uh, Cheryl talk a little bit about this one. Is that what should institutions be doing? Uh, what are the next steps that you should be uh, uh, should be taken with all of this? And uh, our advice to you is uh, don't wait. Uh, get started. Uh, uh, doing your best uh, analysis on this and reviewing contracts and see if you think that they fit um, and then involving leadership. I'll share, I'll say a little bit more about that. And then uh, what you'll have to do is develop your best interpretation and uh, and, and would suggest that you uh, apply that interpretation as universally as, as possible and be watching for updates on this. And remember that you have September 1st to uh, put those contracts in. Uh, Cheryl, what other advice do you have for next steps? So. Yeah, so I appreciate that, Russ, and that goes hand in hand with what Phil was saying about how we we may see some tweaks to this to this guidance, and uh, but we don't know when and we don't know what. So getting started uh, in the review of your um, of your interactions with what you are outsourcing um, for your institution is important. So you know, in in, in my opinion, I, I believe you need to start with your general counsel, and if that's your first. Uh, commun line of communication is with your general counsel. I will tell you that just last week, um, NACUA, the National Association of College um, uh, uh, and University Attorneys, um, held a pop-up policy uh, review. And uh, in that, they had more than 900 uh, on the call. So I know that it's on their radar. Um, so my suggestion would be to first communicate with your general counsel because with your general counsel, you could determine what institution staff um, should be brought into this discussion and then prepare this related institution staff with the elements of the guidance as you best see it, along with your general counsel, your best interpretation as Russ has been sharing. And then after identifying and preparing the staff, consider what are the related contracts uh, and determine the affected servicers because you're gonna to need to be making communication with those servicers. So you're gonna to wanna to prepare servicers with what could be additional responsibilities if they're now considered a third party servicer. You recall that they have additional responsibilities, joint and several liability, reporting, audits, et cetera. And then you'll wanna work with your GC and your uh, procurement staff, if you have it at your institution to review perhaps revise contracts and or, and or make determinations about the future relationships because you may be needing to address um, some sort of statement of work, um, including coordination of procedures between the institutions and the servicers in order to limit liability um, for actions such as misrepresentation, et cetera. So that would be my simple next steps. Okay, yeah, and just, so it's a question for Rob, you know, but, you know, what if the vendors uh, say it doesn't affect us? And we, one of our blog posts, I noted that uh, we, we have people who are in the, uh, uh, the different stages of grief and, and some are firmly planted in denial. Uh, I think you need to do what you need to do. You have uh, 
paperwork that you need to, if you decide that a vendor is uh, fits the category, you submit yours, uh, you tell the vendor that you've done that, but you cannot force the, the vendor to do anything. So you need to do what you can. I've got just a, a couple others here that I'll go through quickly and that uh, um, about, you know, could the regulation change? I think Phil's already said that uh, it's likely that we think that there will be some uh, changes and uh, I see uh, Giselle is asking about, uh, how I, we, we think that there's some of those things are happening already where uh, changes will come out, but they usually uh, uh, are talking about that so openly. Do you want to say more about that, Phil, on changes? Or? Well, <laughs> I there's a lot of speculation about what the nature of the changes would be. And actually, I wouldn't mind, it, Russ, if you don't mind going back to the previous comment. Part of the issue, why we're in this place is guidance is supposed to be clarifying and this guidance was the opposite of that and so when you have when i'm seeing questions such as hey our vendor is saying uh, we're not tps well what do you do well part of the issue is that if you look at the language and the guidance it's pretty clear that learning management systems are included in this it's hard to get around that but if you go and you look at the statute in the def original definition of TPS, legal from a legally defensible standpoint, they have a pretty strong argument that's at least taking somewhere. So that puts schools in this position of, well, do I listen to this or do I go with guidance or do I interpret my own thing? So I just want to point out part of the reason some of these questions are so confusing is because this process issued guidance that was the opposite of clarifying. Yeah, and, and Ricky makes a good point in here too, that what people want, and we've seen this in other regulatory things, they want a spreadsheet where they go down and say, oh, here's this service and, and is it or not? But it depends how you do it in your, uh, what the contract is in your place. So you have to do some analysis as well. Um, yeah, thanks, Phil. And my, my last thing here is about, uh, uh, we had some questions, I'll do this quickly, about uh, OPMs and should they be changing your contracts now? Remember that the things about OPMs, were, they have not changed any regulations right now. We're expecting that to come. Uh, so you just, third-party services, you just need to, you know, identify that you have uh, those vendors, uh, but there's nothing that you really need to, nothing has changed about the uh, um, the revenue share, or those rules that we talked about at the very start, you're just asking about that. So don't go changing your contracts uh, quite quite yet. With that, Phil, I'm going to turn it to you, I think, next. Okay. Well, let me uh, capture where we've aggregated some of the questions. And, uh, and Rob, what Rob asks is very common with what we got going in. How does our contract with our LMS get affected? And besides LMS, do contracts with respondents turn it in, get audited, and others, SIS, courseware. The reason this comes up so specifically besides the thing is if you look at part of this table that was provided by the Department of Education, they added a clause about providing computer services or software, uh, any aspect of the programs, including but not limited to systems related to financial aid management, recruiting and enrollment, admissions, registration, hello SIS, billing and learning management. So on the surface, they specifically called out learning management, but they also essentially called out student information systems. And they called out later on uh, student retention and tutoring and support systems. So if you want to look to see if it's possible, are we included there? Most of the ed tech world has been listed in one way or the other. However, some of these uh, interpretations contradict each other with what's excluded, what's included. And this gets to where I was saying it didn't really clarify, but there's definitely elements in there. What this leads to is on the surface, these LMS contracts look like they're within the guidance, the new expanded guidance, but who's going to adjudicate? Did we really mean that? It's set up to just be the Department of Education. And so there is some fuzziness, but it's there. Another question that's related is, 
our publisher materials and sites included if the instructor is making the decision about what is done and what the value of it. Basically, what about instructional content, courseware providers, publishers? And if you look at some of the table that was in the guidance, they talked about assessing student learning, including through electronic means, determining requirements of a course, developing curricular or course materials, unless the institution maintains full control of the curriculum materials and delivers the instruction itself. Well, one of the questions is with today's courseware that's designed around learning outcomes, has built-in formative and summative assessments, you could see an argument saying this captures instructional content or certainly courseware within the, within the expansion of TPS. So this one is trickier. It's not as explicitly called out as learning management. And it depends on the definition of requirements. Is that learning objectives or is it the department coming up with uh, what the definition of a course and a program is? So it is trickier, but long and short, it's up to the department because the written descriptions are sort of vague. And so now schools are gonna need to figure out how to interpret this, but it does have elements that pull in instructional content. And I would, I'll add one more, then I'll open it back up to, um, to Russ and Cheryl, but there was the question about state agencies that's already been mentioned. One of the questions is, are state level consortia funded by the legislature considered TPS? Will public higher ed online consortiums be considered a TPS if they're managed by an agency and not an accredited institution? This one is actually interesting because they, they addressed in a Q&A beneath the table um, this question and the Department of Education answer was yes. If a state agency performs Title IV functions or services on behalf of an eligible institution, the state agency is considered a TPS and subject to the applicable regulations. And this was in the context of providing instruction and stuff like that. So you could, so certainly state agencies appear to be within the scope and they even addressed it in the Q&A. Now, if I were gonna take this to court, and I could say, well, in your Q&A, you specifically went back to Title IV functions, and I do not agree with your interpretation that providing an educational program that is eligible for Title IV is the same thing as a Title IV function. So this gets to the whole area of, on the surface, there's a lot that's included here, and it's called out. But if you really wanted to fight it, there are arguments to be made saying their interpretation was just wrong and there's going to be pushback, but what's going to be the problems in between? This is part of the reason that Russ and Cheryl are talking about needing to have legal counsel involved in advising you which way to take this. But uh, Russ and Cheryl, I know you guys do a lot of work with consortia and state agencies. Anything you'd like to add or clarify on the state agency question? Yeah, we've, we've I don't know that I can clarify anything other than that we, we talked to our members who are systems and consortia and we presented it to um, a SHIO meeting uh, last week, I guess, I guess it was. And so that they're, you know, they have some real concerns about some of the different things that they, that they do because they can see where a lot of services could, uh, could, could, could fit under that and, and trying to figure out um, when I first read it, I was wondering about, I, 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 I'm having a hard time remember where, uh, students were harmed by these these sorts of relationships uh, that are put together to try to um, do more for students in, in all this and do more across institutions. And so I'll, I'll be interested to see what how they uh, follow through on that. Yep. I know that we're mostly addressing the questions from registration, but there is a discussion I would like to call out. It was talking about how things seem to be written. Uh, I think uh, the interpretation is very correct, uh, Clay and Karen talking about the way this was written was very much on the consumer mindset, think tank advocacy organization being the driver or inspiration or even the writing of this, and not from people who are actively involved and in, here's how we have to administer a school and what we need to be. That's part of the reason I'm saying you've got to think politically here 
not just so I went outside of my own scope here, but I thought I wanted to address that conversation. And, and let's hope we give the department grace that if they decide, oh, okay, this was more than we meant, and that they bring it back, that yes, you know, we, we honor that they do that. So, yes, Cheryl, do you want to go to your question? Sure. So, so we have several people that have been asking about the international circumstances, and so we had several questions um, boiling down to uh, kind of specifically about what the guidance was that was provided, and um, what we were hearing is that there was some surprise that it is now um, being addressed because it was initially released it was initially released in guidance in the Q&A section in 2016 but it was not elevated to the discussions until currently and specifically the institution is um, may not contract with a third party servicer to perform any aspect of the institution's participation in title IV program um, if the servicer, servicer is located outside of the United States or owned or operated by an individual who's not a citizen or, or national or lawful permanent resident. That's what we have to work with. And so we do not have any um, clearer understanding of any other parameters. It looks, in, in my mind, you know, I'm looking at it rather conservatively um, to determine you know, who should be considered um, a foreign entity at this point. Um, to determine if they're people, if these are organizations that, you know, there is a concern about whether they can be a TPS. So we wonder then, so how do we address vendors? Because we know of vendors who are located um, in other countries. And actually one I really appreciated the other day came in asking, well, does this apply to Canadian um, groups, organizations? And, you know, um, there are nor our border, north Northern border friend, and, uh, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, if you're working with a Canadian group, um, I would say at this point, it is unclear um, based on this language about whether uh, they can be a, a third party servicer. We'll have to learn more. So is, as far as what we know, um, institutions should review the entities and the functions of those entities through the lens of this new guidance. So who are the entities and for whom are you contracting? so that you can determine if they are a foreign entity because they are not to perform any aspect. And I would communicate with that servicer or subcontractor as listed in the um, guidance as well. So communicate with the servicer or subcontractor if, if you believe they're located outside of the US or they're owned or operated um, by an individual who's not a citizen. So it's very unclear. We're waiting to learn. And I have to add that the um, public comment opportunity specifically when they updated the guidance suggested that they wanted to hear from folks about um, how to address um, the limitation, they used the word limitation, on foreign owned or controlled organizations as a TPS. And they um, are specifically interested because they're concerned about the ability um, to hold these servicers liable if necessary, because they're outside of the country. So, you know, they are very interested in this. And so we would strongly urge you, um, if you have um, interactions with a foreign vendor that um, you would want to communicate with the department and learn more. Um, so let's see, so there was that. And then, oh, how does this apply to study abroad groups? Well, okay, so naturally we just talked about, um, you know, if it's a foreign entity, but, we should also consider that if they're, um, they're also um, a coordination with foreign institutions or there's some co-teaching with faculty from outside the US or the foreign education study abroad organizations. So, you know, we look at that and so you're gonna have to review that um, and uh, related to the any aspect um, review to see that they are um, falling into that category. And um, so, and then second, even if the study abroad organization is all US based, you would need to consider if they're, dare I say, a traditional third party servicer in that they are providing certain um, functions, you're outsourcing certain functions um, for the student to participate in the uh, in Title IV within that program. So is there anything in regard to an international Phil and Russ that you want to add to that? 
The one, I would add a comment that somebody shared with me privately, that if you think through the foreign implications and study abroad, is that if it doesn't change, and I agree with you, it's probably the most likely area to change in this, um, in this guidance, but if it doesn't change, one of the impacts will be only students who don't require financial aid will have these opportunities with study abroad. So no, I agree with your analysis, but that was an interesting point that somebody made to me privately. So this Donna, is quite expansive. Yes, Russ, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, were you going to say more, Cheryl? Let me see. Go ahead. You know, I, I guess one of the things I'm seeing in the uh, in the chat is that they may be expanding it out more than was in, intended because a lot of the uh, international is based upon if you're contracting with uh, companies that are uh, owned or controlled financially, but uh, but they so that that was a very clear thing about owner controlled. Because there may be some where the ownership and control is in the U.S. Is that correct? But they do things internationally. That's a that's a different thing, right? So my suggestion then again is you do take at this point until we learn more is a conservative approach and work with your general counsel to determine next steps at this point until we get more guidance on that matter. But which leads me as I look at the time to the to um, questions about communication. And so one of our, our big points about having this webinar today was to encourage you to prepare a public comment. And so we had several people ask us, you know, well, what do we do to prepare? And so, you know, as we look at this, I have several steps that I can encourage you to um, walk through. First is the review of the contracts to determine if the entities provide functions of the contracts that may be um, a third party servicer based on this expanded guidance. Evaluate and determine the consequences if the entity would be considered a third party servicer. So questions that you would ask um, at your institution is, should the institution revise the contract with the third party servicers, or in some cases may take steps to end the relationship with the entity? Are there illogical consequences um, affecting these contracts? And how does it affect students? So when you're writing the comment, obviously you're gonna to wanna to be respectful and thoughtful in your comments, but you're gonna to wanna to ask clarifying questions about the language of the guidance. You're gonna to wanna to ask questions about implementation of the guidance, perhaps use examples of functions at your own institution and provide stories of concern leading to illogical consequences, provide examples that will affect students. Share concerns to the institution in regard to liability, execution of the expanded guidance um, elements that you're finding. And then I, I do want to point out, I'm, I'm talking about all these in, that's appearing negative, but, but you may also include in guidance providing comments that are supportive of language, if that's where you are at your institution, and what might be particularly helpful or important that is part of the current guidance. And remember that the department indicated that they are particularly interested in comments on this um, limitation uh, for foreign owned or controlled organizations as a TPS. And so um, I'm going to put one in the chat. We have some representatives from um, some folks uh, with us today from Educause who purposely put out their comment early um, to be able to share with folks. You can review comments that um, have already been posted, but you may want to um, review one that I have um, the link for right here. And so I will put that in and add, um, and then just turn it back to Russ and, and Phil to uh, add any other comments about commenting. No, I think you covered it very well as far as what people need to be active in providing comments. I'm actually writing a blog post now looking at the publicly available comments on TPS. There's a lot more in bundled services exception than there are for TPS when I think that the Department of Education needs to hear real world examples. So I fully endorse what Cheryl was saying about what schools should do. Give real, realistic answers and information to help them understand what's happening, positive or negative. Yeah, and I think in, in, uh, if you're uncomfortable with commenting, you know that you can, you can comment, just make sure that you're uh, only commenting officially. If somebody said you could do that, uh, but if if not, just you know, case teams at ed.gov. Uh, bring that up again. Uh, you can ask questions. Everybody can ask questions about this. Uh, we've had some questions about uh, including the chat. Uh, we'll we'll see what we can do about doing. I think we should be able to do that to include the chat because we had lots of great 
uh, information this, but we'll get the uh, chat, the recording, and the slides uh, out to everyone and up uh, very, very soon. Um, you know, you know, come join us here. We'd love to have you. Uh, uh, Phil's new service is uh, really great. It's premium coverage. So uh, we'll pr uh, promo that for you, Phil. It's uh, done well. Uh, it's a, this is a lot of stuff. There's no sure answers, and the answers are going to change. You've already seen the guidance. You know, the dates changed twice since February 15th uh, on things, and so we're. <laughs> Uh, this is a moving target. We'll do our best to continue to keep you uh, up to date, and so we'll uh, we'll do that. Uh, with that, uh, Phil, thank you so much for always being a good partner with us. Cheryl, uh, your analysis is aces as always, and so uh, with that, we want to thank uh, uh, Catherine and the team for their help behind the scenes, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about this again in the future. Take care. Thank you.